Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, robotics. Uh, and it's a fascinating uh, area for me because I think it's uh, both technologically and uh, fascinating, it's practical, but it's also very philosophical. And I hope I'll be able to share some of these practical and philosophical angles uh, about robotics with you today. So uh, robotics is also the, the sort of the story of, of robotics is very much follows this classical uh, singularity curve, the exponential versus the linear, because for many years, uh, robotics was sort of a disappointment. We used to see it in movies a lot, we used to hear about it, imagine, talk a lot about what robotics could one day do, uh, but so nothing really happened. You walk down the street, you don't see any robots, you went home, you didn't see any robots either. But something is happening right now that is beginning to change that world. And I want to talk a little bit about what are the trends that are driving this and where it's going. So we've seen a lot of robots already, uh, depending on where you started watching uh, sci-fi movies. You've seen robots, sometimes happy robots, sometimes bad robots. But the reality is that most robots today still live in factories, and that has been sort of the where most robots have been for the past, I'd say, couple of decades. Uh, in fact, uh, only a few robots made it out of the factory, uh, and these robots that we have at home are generally toys or much less impressive than what we actually see uh, in reality in, the, in, in movies. For example, uh, most of the useful robots we might have at home are vacuum cleaning robots. And I wonder, actually, how many people here have a vacuum cleaning robot at home? Okay, well, that's, that's a pretty good, that's a much more than average when I uh, give these talks. It's good to know. I have five of these at home. Uh, five of them, actually, they don't clean very well uh, when they are in the same room. You have to separate them out. But it's interesting to see that, that the whole robotics area is growing rapidly. This is, for example, just uh, industrial robots in China the last couple of years. You can see an exponential growth as China is beginning to replace its own workforce uh, with robots. Uh, but I want to start off by just expanding the view of what is a robot, because most people think a robot is either a humanoid or a sort of industrial robot, and we have this almost dichotomy, but the reality is that we have all kinds of robots. We have uh, medical robots, and we have drones that can carry things and move them around. We have warehouse robots that are beginning to basically reshape e-commerce. Uh, we have even uh, uh, robots that uh, can help you get dressed and help and talk about fashion, or robots that can do room service. Uh, there are even robots that can uh, find things in stores and do inventory automatically. These are large robots, but there's also small, tiny robots that can zip around. This is real-time, millimeter-scale robots, and even nanoscale robots uh, that can swim through the bloodstream. And, and people are starting to talk about delivery of drugs and so forth. There are hard robots, there are soft robots, there are cuddly robots even that can help us uh, with uh, therapy, uh, especially for dementia and things like that where people need to talk and take care of something in order to, to stay alive. And my favorite robot that most, probably most of you are not thinking of as a robot is the driverless car. And the driverless car is perhaps going to be the first fully autonomous robot that you will uh, interact with on a daily basis, not only interact, you will trust the, your lives to and the lives of your children to. But let me start at the beginning. What is a robot? And it's a big uh, debate uh, of what exactly it is, but I'll, I'll cut, cut down to the chase and say it's really anything that has these two, problem, uh, two characteristics. It moves, mobility, and, it, and programmability. When you put these two things together, you get a robot. So it's not about automation, as what well most of us think about robotics. There are lots of automatic machines out there that they're not programmable, flexible. It's about uh, things that move and are programmable. So your phone uh, is programmable, but it doesn't move very much. Your car, your old car moves, but it's not programmable. But when you take these two together, you put them together, you get a robot. So that combination of programmability and mobility is really what makes uh, a robot. So why are robots taking off now? Where, what's the origin of that exponential curve that I drew earlier? So let me show you a couple of driving forces, and I'll start with the most obvious driving force, which is Moore's Law. This idea that machines or computers are getting faster, cheaper, and better at an exponential rate. So this is a chart you've probably seen before, 
of computing power that you can get for one dollar over a hundred uh, a period of a hundred years, going all the way from 1900s all the way to today. You can see what an exponential curve looks like on the log scale. But I think most people look at this chart and they don't really understand what an how fast this chart is moving forward. So I took this data and I replotted it on a linear scale. This is what it looks like for real. These are gigaflops per dollar over the last hundred years. So look at where we are today and look at where the four people in 2000 were. They thought they had fast computers back then. But in case you get too comfortable with this, let me show you what this chart will look like 10 years from today when we meet again and talk about this. Assuming Moore's Law will continue for another 10 years, it's not a big assumption. This is what it's going to look like in 2028, and this is where we are today on that curve. So this is the first trend, it's computing power, but there's other things that are driving robotics, some things we don't necessarily talk about. For example, electrical power, the real power that drives the motors and makes robots move around. So innovations in battery technology, the ability to carry power, uh, have been improving exponentially as well. Not only that, but the, the fact that components from which we make robots are getting more efficient in power use. Everybody knows the, about LEDs that are so much more efficient than light bulbs. So these kinds of components allow us to do a lot more with a small amount of power. This is another version of Moore's Law, but this time the amount of computation not per dollar, but the amount of computation you can get per watt of electric power. And you can see that it's growing exponentially as well. The same thing for GPS sensors and all of these things. When you put them together, you get, for example, drones that can fly around. And again, a piece, big piece of why we have drones today and we didn't have them maybe five years ago is because of battery technology along with better power efficiency components that allow drones to fly around and do things. So today, an average drone can fly around maybe half an hour carrying something. That's not quite enough to revolutionize e-commerce. But you can bet you that in three or four years when drones can fly three hours untethered, we'll see a revolution because of these kinds of robots. So power is a big piece of the puzzle. There's also the way we manufacture robots that is changing over time. Uh, increasingly, we can make robots, for example, using technology, digital manufacturing, 3D printing, and so forth, that allow us to make robots with organic shapes and complexities that were unimaginable, or at least not commercially viable, just a few years ago. That, those kinds of technologies are moving towards the ability also to print things like batteries, uh, muscles, actuators, different kinds of material science that allow us to make robots with physical characteristics that were not possible before. It's also very accessible technology. You needed to be uh, a university, to have, be, have a college degree to make a robot, but now we have kids coming out of high school or even elementary school uh, that can take a couple of components that cost a few dollars and put them together and make a robot that would earn them a PhD just a few years ago. So this accessibility of this technology is also creating a lot of innovation. But perhaps the biggest revolution that happened in robotics in the last couple of years is the way we program robots. And that has changed dramatically what we can do with them. So you see, for most of the robotic history, we, we fell into this trap of the, the idea that we would program ro robots with rules. We can program the robot to do this and that, and this situation it should do this, and that situation it should do that, so that we can, we can set out if-then-else rules. But the reality is that increasingly, uh, we found a new way to program robots using what we call machine learning or probabilistic learning, where we don't tell the robot what to do, we show the robot what to do. And the robot learns by looking at data and calculating the odds and understanding that in some situations this is more likely to happen, in other situations that is more likely to happen. So that probabilistic understanding of intelligence allows us to move from robots that can work in a factory and obey rules perfectly, which is what we want them to do in manufacturing world, to start going outside. But it turns out that it's not so simple. When people uh, started looking at making robots that can go outside, for example, robots that can navigate obstacle, the rule systems that worked in the real world, that worked in the clean lab with nice obstacles, failed miserably when robots in the 1970s were taken out from the lab into the real world. This is the, one of the first uh, uh, autonomous robots roaming in Stanford, uh, and uh, it is uh, going at an amazing speed of one centimeter an hour. 
and it still falls off the road because it can't understand what it's seeing. And that was 1970s. If you fast forward to 2005, DARPA holds a, a grand, grand challenge competition of cars that can drive across the desert, and still the problem persists that nobody can get uh, the car to stay on the road. 30 years. And that the root of it is that robots couldn't understand what they were seeing. In fact, up until six years ago, no robot with all the intelligence and all the computing power in the world and all the data could understand the difference between a dog and a cat. Isn't that embarrassing? Even a one-year-old child can understand the difference between these two, but no AI system, no robot could understand what it was seeing. Or the difference between a bicycle and a motorcycle. So that is a fundamental problem in how robots could understand the world, and this is why robots were confined to factories and couldn't actually go outside. In fact, the situation was so bad that in 2010, the AI and robotics community released a million images to see if somebody can write software that would automatically understand what's in each image. They released a million uh, images, a thousand images in a thousand different categories, a thousand images of sunflowers, a thousand images of sushi, a thousand images of, of, of Superman, a thousand images of cats, and a thousand images of dogs, a thousand images in a thousand different categories, a million images in total, and they wanted to see if anybody could write software that would allow a machine to understand what it is seeing in the real world. Now humans get it right with 95% accuracy, 19 out of 20. How well do, do machines do? So the day of the competition came, 2010, midnight, September 30, and the results came in. The best software from around the world got it right 75% of the time. So 75% of the time is not good enough for doing many things. If 75% is good enough for winning the stock market or winning world championship in chess, but 75% is not good enough for driving a car. So 2011 comes along, competition is run again, Everybody waits, everybody looks at the scoreboard. Uh, big companies, small companies, all around the world compete, and the best software comes in again at 75%. 2012 comes along, and again the competition is run, and it looks like the needle isn't going to move because the error is still around 25%, but September 30, midnight, 2012 comes along, and suddenly the error drops to 15, to 16%. For the first time in history, somebody made software that could understand what it was seeing is substantially better than anything before. They released the open, the, the, it was called deep learning, and this one term you have to remember about AI software uh, is deep learning, and that uh, was released open source. The next year, everybody copies it. Error goes down to 10%. Remember, human level is 5% error, so you're still safe. The next uh, year, the error goes down to 6%. 2015, it goes down to 3.5%. 2016, it goes down to 2.9% error. 2017, the competition is no longer held. Machines can finally understand what is around them. And embarrassingly, behind the scenes, it's a technology called neural networks invented, in, demonstrated in 1957. The same technology, almost 40 years of AI gone down the drain, we're going back to 1960s, 1950s ideas, but we're just feeding it incredible amounts of data. So today's, today, brains of robots are built on these neural networks that are many, many layers deep, and this is why they're called deep learning, and so a robot can finally look, at, look through its eyes and understand what is in front of it. It can see that there's a dog here, a person, a chair, and another chair, and you have to remember just six years ago, no robot could understand what it was seeing. Machines were blind. But now, this is just the beginning because this image, produced by a camera, was generated for human consumption. It has red, green, and blue pixels. But the robot can see the world in lots of different colors, in a broad swath of the spectrum, at night, at a high frame rate, not with two eyes, but with 20 eyes. So for example, driverless cars are entirely enabled by this technology. Uh, here's another example. We have these drones that we're developing in our lab that fly over cornfields and they look down at each and every leaf and they can identify minute signs of northern leaf blight that is killing 13% of crop and they can spray just that plant instead of spraying the entire field. What does that do to agriculture? 
What does it do to pesticides? Uh, that data can then be used to breed even better crops. Uh, and this is what the AI uh, sees, what the robot, the drone sees through its, through its eyes. You have robots for the first time in history can work side by side with humans. Well, how is that possible? Because they can, for the first time, see the human. They can understand what the human is doing. They can make sure they don't hit the human. It's also easier to program these robots because they can copy what the human is doing. You don't need to have a degree, a PhD degree in robotics to teach a robot. You can just show it what to do. It's bad news for me because I teach PhDs in robotics, but it's good news for the rest of the world, and this is how robotics is moving forward. Now, you have to remember that all this technology is free. It is open source, it is free. Companies are, they're not only free, companies are pushing it. They're even pushing the computer computing power. But what is not free is the data to train this system. And again, when all of you think about how to use robotics and AI in your own uh, adventures, in your own businesses, in your own interest, think not about the technology, but think about the data that you have access to, the business opportunities that only you can see. And that combination of data and business opportunities is where the gold is. That's where the impact is. The technology itself is open and free and pretty easy to use. But there's also a dark side to this, and I'll tell you one story. We were building a robot uh, for a big demonstration that we're going to do at NIPS, the big conference in AI and robotics, and we put the robot, uh, we were going to put the robot in the middle of the stage like this, in front of 2,000 AI experts. And the robot was going to do something very simple. We would walk over to the robot and show it a banana or water bottle, the kind of things you find in a conference and the robot would yell out what it's seeing. That was the demo we were planning to do. A very simple demo. It sounds silly almost, but that was state of the art of robotics just a few years ago. So we were practicing this for weeks before the demo, and what you're seeing here is a screenshot from one of the, from one of the software developers, and it's showing you on the top left is what the actual uh, robot is seeing through its eyes, and the right side is a grid showing you what about 200 neurons in this huge brain that the robot had with a million neurons in it, what these 200 neurons are sensing or responding to in the image. So a very simple kind of uh, test, like sticking electrodes into a big brain. So you can see that most of the neurons are dark, which means they're not interested in anything here in this particular scene. These are the two software developers that were building the robot. But there was one neuron over there that seemed to be very active. So we zoomed in to see what it was responding to, and turns out, that it was tracking the software developers. And this was very strange because we only trained this robot to, to identify bananas and water bottles and yet it's tracking the software developers, including the guy there in the back. How did that happen? We thought maybe it was a hack, a prank. But after about a week of thinking about this, we realized, we, we believed we understood what happened. What had happened probably is that the robot learned that it was always these two people that brought the bananas and the water bottle. And if it could track them, it could do a better job at understanding when the bottle and the bananas are coming. So that was amazing and terrifying at the same time. Amazing because the AI and the robot learned what it needed to learn, but terrifying because who knows what else it gets out of the data. And again, this is just the beginning. So finally, the last thing that is driving robotics is the cloud. And what I mean by the cloud is something very different. It's not uploading and downloading from the cloud. What I mean by cloud for robotics is robots teaching other robots. Now I'll just give you one example of that. If you think about driverless cars, how a human can have only one lifetime of experience of driving, but a driverless car can learn from all other driverless cars. And so the more driverless cars there are on the road, the better each one of them gets. This is not true for us, Humans, we don't become better because there are more drivers on the road, we become a little bit worse. So this is the way that robots can teach robots. And so we have these multiple compounding exponentials. Yes, at the beginning we have Moore's Law, which don't get me wrong, it is moving fast, faster than you can even imagine. But on top of that, we have other exponentials that are moving forward. We have battery technology, power technology, we have manufacturing technologies that align us to make more organic, and interesting and complex robots. We have exponential growth in data that is feeding the new AI algorithms. We have the growth in the capacity of machine learning neural networks to, to, to learn as they become bigger and bigger and deeper 
and deeper. And finally, we have the cloud that is allowing these machines to learn from each other. And this is, I think, the, sort of the, the mother of exponentials in, in terms of how these machines move forward. So I'll end by looking a little bit into the future. Where is robotics going to go uh, from here? So if you think about it, everything I've showed you up until now is the past and the present. So what about the future? So I like to think about robotics as moving forward in waves, starting with the first wave, the first 50, wave, uh, 50 years of robotics, which was rule-based. And these are factory robots, and they're very good, but they're confined to one place, and they can only sort of do uh, one thing. In the 90s, we trend, uh, so this is sort of the governing of a rule-based AI. In the 90s, we started switching to data-driven robotics, robots that can see in a limited way, they have algorithms, the computer vision, they can sort of understand and learn from sort of very strict uh, data, uh, types of data. We are now in the middle of cognitive robotics wave. Uh, it's the wave where robots can finally start understanding natural scenes. They can understand not just tabulated data in spreadsheets, as was well the second wave, but they can understand video, audio, uh, they can understand uh, uh, images, they can understand even spoken language. This, uh, this allows robots to do things that previously were reserved for humans, but also allowed them to interact with humans in lots of interesting ways. For example, the drones that, that uh, will change agriculture are entirely based on this new capability, as well as driverless cars, uh, entirely enabled uh, by this new technology. So what are the next three waves? So we're in the middle of the third wave, and I wanna, I wanna uh, talk, uh, to sort of try to, uh, to estimate or guess where, what are the next three waves going to be. So the, the next wave is probably going to be sort of what we call creative robots. Creativity is one of these things that we traditionally attribute to humans, but I can already see bubbling in academia this trend of machines that can't just consume data and make decisions, but can create new things. For example, robots that can design antennas out of their own imagination, and those antennas outperform the best antennas designed by humans, or design whole furniture and make it. And not just engineering, but even art. This is a robot uh, that I have at home, and it's actually started when my wife and I were taking uh, oil painting classes a couple of uh, years ago, uh, over the weekends. And after a couple of uh, weeks of uh, doing this, the instructor came to me and said, uh, maybe you should stick to robotics. Maybe painting isn't your thing. So I went home and I built a robot that paints. And in the beginning, it didn't paint very well, but now it, it begins to paint really nicely. It paints large oil and canvas paintings. In fact, it recently painted this picture that won it an international award. Uh, a, a flower out of its own imagination. And it is now hiking somewhere in India in street view. And when I come home, I'll see what it painted. It's come getting its own experiences and it's learning uh, as it goes. The fifth wave is the wave, the humanoid wave. And there's something magical about making robots that look like humans. And we keep seeing these amazing robots that appear to be doing backflips and all kinds of crazy things, but the reality is actually uh, not as exciting. This is the, the state-of-the-art robotics in a recent DARPA competition. Uh, these are million-dollar robots uh, with incredible teams, and it turns out that it's very, very difficult to make a humanoid robot that has the dexterity that we humans have. So there's lots of these, this, this was actually more the norm than the special case. And uh, it, I bet you that you will have software driving your car tomorrow. But when your car breaks down, it's going to be a human that will crawl around and fix it. And as H.G. Wells said about the aliens and the war of the worlds, uh, it is uh, the robots uh, have not yet earned their place in the real world. We have crawled through sand and mud and rain, and machines have not done that yet, and they still have to learn how to do that. So, when you think about jobs, for example, remember that AI and robotics have replaced uh, radiologists and lawyers, but it's very difficult to replace a plumber, an electrician, a nurse, a hairdresser, the, uh, a surgeon. These physical jobs are very, very difficult and they're not going to go away anytime soon. And I'll end with the ultimate question about robotics. And that is the question as whether robots 
will have feelings. Uh, we know that robots can imitate feelings, they can recognize feelings, but will they have feelings? They can paint art and generate music, but can they actually have emotions? And I say it can happen, it happens when robots take all this AI that we've been talking about and instead of modeling the world, they model themselves. And I'll show you one example of that. This is a robot that has lots of sensors and actuators, but it is blind. It cannot see anything about the world, it can only see itself. And uh, it uh, learns how to move, but it doesn't learn how to move by being programmed by rules or being, by learning a physical reality. It begins to understand what it is. And you can see that in the beginning it has no clue if it's a spider or a snake or a tree. It has no clue what it is, but two days into the process, and it's a simple enough robot that can actually peek inside its brain to understand what it thinks about itself, we can see that it figured out it has four legs but doesn't quite know how they're connected and where. And this is four days into the process, it pretty much figured out what it is. Now, giving that self-picture, that self-image, it learns how to walk, but it learns how to walk in its imagination. Just like you can think about how you might climb a tree tomorrow without actually doing it. And here it is, walking in physical reality for the first time using its self-image. And to test this, we did something very cruel. We chopped off a leg and we watched what happened. And you can see that the robot, in the first uh, day, it doesn't quite know what's going on because its self-image doesn't match its sensations. But over about a period of 24 hours, gradually its self-image adapts to the, and it learns autonomously that it must have lost a leg and that's the only way to sort of be consistent with the sensations that it has. And here it is learning how to walk without a leg. And I know it's very sad, but we did put the leg together again, and the robot is happily retired. But here you can see the robot moving for the first time without a leg, and you can see almost that it's trying to move. It has a primitive sensation of self. Again, nothing even closely or remotely uh, as complex as human self-awareness, but something very similar. All right, so lots of ethical questions. Uh, should we do this? Where is this going? How is it going to end? Uh, I think in general a lot of good things can happen, but of course this is a very powerful technology that we should keep thinking about and make sure that bad people don't use to do bad things. But one thing is sure, that uh, robotics now is on the cusp of what we call the Cambrian explosion, the ability to create all forms of diverse robotics that will change everything forever. Thank you.